So I have a very difficult question to ask in this particular video, and that is, what is discourse analysis? It's a really difficult question to ask and to answer because it means so many different things to so many different people. Uh, so I want to explain a few things about how people differentially look at discourse and thus how they look at discourse analysis. Uh, and I'll just have some quick examples for you. So the first question to ask really is what is discourse? Uh, if you're going to do analysis of it, your understanding of what it is, discourse, uh, really has a lot to do with how you're going to go about methodologically looking at discourse. So Schifrin et al. Uh, wrote a really nice handbook, uh, and in their introduction, they note that there are really three main categories of definitions of discourse, even though when you uh, read a, a book on discourse analysis, oftentimes you'll see lots of things that don't necessarily put it into any kind of concise definition. But they kind of sum it up as these three. Anything beyond the sentence. So in a previous video, I talked about how you've got uh, phonology and morphology, uh, syntax, semantics, pragmatics, all of those things that go into sentence level uh, kinds of uh, uh, linguistic details. Discourse then looks at anything beyond just that singular sentence. So if you string two sentences together or if you have two people in conversation that are you know, doing a sentence each, then you've got discourse. Second definition is language in use. So this is actually how people go about doing language in the context that they're doing it. So uh, any kind of uh, situation where uh, people are actually doing things with language, that would be language in use. So a conversation that you and I might have in a coffee shop uh, would be use of language in a particular situation. And someone could sit down and analyze the discourse of that particular conversation. And the third one is one that tends to get used a lot more these days in academia, but it's one that's a little bit more difficult to understand. It's a, a broader range of social practice that includes non-linguistic and non-specific instances of language use. So uh, in this sense, uh, discourse can include social practices that are non-linguistic, things like the clothing that people are wearing, uh, the kinds of uh, things that they're carrying with them, technology devices or bags or uh, props or whatever they happen to have with them, um, uh, gestures, I mean, all of those things that actually don't count as a sort of linguistic piece of language uh, can count within these things that we talk about in terms of social practice. And also non-specific instances of language use. So they don't have to be actual, uh, as with definition number two, language in use, a particular situation, but a general understanding of what people do in conversation or in writing uh, in terms of the kinds of uh, understandings they bring to uh, any particular topic. And particularly for uh, that third one, I think Foucault, uh, Michel Foucault's uh, sense of discourse is uh, the one that's probably the most uh, often used. And for Foucault, it's not just the language of an individual communication. Foucault would regard that as just a, simply a sample of a discourse. Really, he's understanding discourse to mean the larger systems of thought that go on within a particular historical location that make certain things thinkable and sayable and also regulate who can say them. So it's these kinds of larger themes and ideas and understandings that we have that in some ways precede any actual language use so that we understand these discourses about, say, the military, uh, discourses about uh, madness, about disease, about religion, I mean all sorts of discourses that precede anything we actually say so and they kind of contain uh, what is actually thinkable and sayable 
at those times. And again, it's about a particular historical location for those things. Uh, so oftentimes Foucault would look back uh, several centuries at how people looked uh, at and thought about madness, for instance, and how those understandings, those discourses about madness would change over time. So if those are the three senses that we have of discourse, language beyond the sentence, language in use, or larger social practices, what then is discourse analysis? How do we go about actually thinking through what discourses do and how they operate? So Jim G. in his book, An Introduction to Discourse Analysis, breaks down discourse analysis into two basic approaches. One which would be basically purely descriptive, largely linguistic. Uh, so looking at the actual language details and how languages and their grammars uh, work together to kind of cohere and make things uh, that people say meaningful uh, in, in a broad sense. And the second basic approach would then be critical. So more applied understandings of that linguistic information and with a particularly political bent. So understanding how power flows and operates within society using language. And Hodges and colleagues in a 2008 article kind of lay out three different approaches to discourse analysis. So they break it down a little bit differently. One would be formal linguistic discourse analysis, very descriptive. And that would be taking samples of written or oral language and texts and doing microanalysis of the linguistic, grammatical, and semantic uses and meanings of text. Uh, and also in a sort of descriptive vein would be empirical discourse analysis. So this kind of lines up with more language in use. The first one, formal linguistic discourse analysis, lined up with language beyond the sentence. This is more, uh, and the second one, empirical discourse analysis, is language in use. So it would be samples of written and oral language and text and data on the uses of the text or that language in social settings. So it would again be microanalysis and to some extent macroanalysis of ways uh, that language and text construct social practices. So how people are actually using them or applying uh, language. And uh, just as G points out, then the third one lines up very well with the uh, larger social practices definition of discourse, which would be critical discourse analysis. And their example is Foucauldian discourse analysis. So you'd be taking samples of written or oral language and text and data on the uses of those texts in social situations and data on the institutions and individuals who produce and are produced by the language text. Now produced and produced by, uh, that would be like if we were talking about mental illness, the people who are producing these texts would be doctors, nurses, psychologists, uh, perhaps uh, religious leaders, those kinds of things, and the people who are produced by those texts, the actual mentally ill people. And those sources of data, you would kind of do a macro analysis of how discourses in many, many forms are actually constructing what's possible for individuals to think and to say. Now, I want to kind of give some illustrations of this and to kind of again line up all of these things together because again there's a lot going on but there's really uh, three different ways that we can think about discourse and corresponding three different ways to think about discourse analysis. So the first one again was language beyond the sentence. And the people who are mainly going to be interested in this kind of discourse and doing that kind of discourse analysis would be linguists. Linguist A here. <clears throat> 
really wants to do what we might think of as diagramming sentences and looking at how those formal properties are playing in discourse analysis or in how people are using more than one sentence or strings of sentences or strings of paragraphs together. Then the second one, remember, is language in use. And this would be mainly applicable, applicable excuse me, to applied linguists. Things like conversation analysis is a sort of subdiscipline you may have heard of. And in this notion of language in use, it's really going to be about that sort of empirical discourse analysis that we talked about. These always focus on particular spates of language use. So it could be something along the lines of how a nurse, and you'll forgive me for using this uh, sort of old style nurse's hat, uh, but how a nurse, the stethoscope, uh, has conversations with a patient or a sick person in the in the bed about post-op care. So someone who's looking at language in use for this particular situation might be interested in uh, things like uh, how she establishes notions of authority in that particular situation. So it would be looking at very on the ground instances of language in use. So that's the second one. And third, then, we'd have the notion of larger social practices. Which would include particularly our, our look at Foucault. Now, you don't have to do Foucauldian analysis to do this third type, but this is one of the ways in which uh, social practices definitions uh, and what we would call critical discourse analysis is often done. And so oftentimes, uh, whereas with the others, linguists or applied linguists would be interested in the other two, uh, lots of social scientists are very interested in the social practices version of discourse and discourse analysis. So sociologists, communications, education, lots of different disciplines are looking to uh, this type of discourse analysis to understand uh, particularly critical issues. So it would be issues of power relations oftentimes and how inequality plays out through language. Uh, so for instance, you might have uh, a question about how a particular period in time and a particular place on a map would construct a particular understanding about an issue or a social kind of object. So for instance, we might talk about masculinity. So how does a particular society at a particular time understand masculinity and what is thinkable and what is sayable about masculinity during that time period? So for instance, uh, masculinity in the 1940s has a lot of overlap with masculinity today, but discourses about the body and masculinity were very different. So if you look at, you know, who were considered very masculine bodies, uh, masculine people back then, you know, you'd have the sort of Sam Spade character, uh, you know, who was tough and didn't take any bull off of anybody, uh, 
but who was in in a lot of ways very sort of small physically whereas when you get to the 1980s uh, and to some extent today muscularity plays a much bigger part of uh, discourses of masculinity so really uh, this this notion of social practices is about critical power dynamics inequalities those kinds of things uh, in producing what is thinkable and sayable at any one time so doing a kind of analysis of these practices involves looking at lots of different texts and showing how these things are temporally and geographically located. So I hope that helps to clear up some of the uh, confusion. Uh, I know it's not going to completely take it all away because again there's three very different contrasting ways of going about doing discourse analysis. None is the the right way to do it, it's just how different kinds of practices have developed and all get basically the same name. But, but as you read more about discourse analysis, I think a lot of the uh, confusion and ambiguity between them clears up. So I hope that's the case for you. Thanks for listening.